The uh, third speaker in this session is Mohamed Mardabox, a PhD student at University College in London. 15 minutes. So, uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, yes, uh, this work is mostly concerned with the communication that we have uh, in chip multiprocessors. And in particular, we're going to look at the shared memory processor. And uh, this arrangement that uh, we considered is actually very similar to uh, one we saw yesterday in the Tylera uh, presentation. Uh, each tile here uh, has uh, its own core, a private uh, L1 cache, and uh, a proportion of the shared L2, and also an, a network interface. Now, the problem that uh, we have when we scale this type of technology is uh, the thermal issue. Uh, it has a negative impact on performance. Now, a lot of research has been done uh, on possible ways to uh, go around this uh, problem. And uh, the one we're going to look at uh, today it concerns uh, photonic uh, network on chips. So basically here, the network interface will be connected to an optical port. And uh, in our work, the optical ports will be connected uh, centrally to uh, an optical crossbar. And uh, previous research have shown by that photonic network on chip have uh, lower power consumption. Lower power consumption would mean lower power dissipation, and therefore would have uh, less uh, thermal issues. So now, since uh, we uh, considering optical communication, we would need to open uh, an optical path so that uh, we can allow this communication to take place. So considering uh, we have a source core and a destination core, and a communication needs to take place uh, between them via the central orbiter, a path request uh, need to first be sent from the source core to the orbiter. Now, if uh, the orbiter will see whether the source core or the destination core are, are taken up uh, in previous communication. And if not, a path grant would be sent back to the source core. Uh, from then on, uh, serialization uh, would occur and the data would be sent from the source core to the destination core via the optical path that has been opened. The first three, that is request arbitration and grant, uh, comprises of the overhead uh, in this communication. So basically, the, the purpose here is just to open the path so that the communication can actually occur. Uh, the second part, that is the sending of the data, uh, have, the, uh, uh, have uh, the serialization in them. In the serialization depends on the message size that uh, uh, is actually present. We have two types. The first one is uh, control message, which is uh, of eight bytes. And the second one is uh, the data messages, which vary between 16 bytes to 256 bytes. Now, in our work, we consider data messages of around uh, uh, 72 bytes. Another uh, approach that we look at it concerns circuit switching. So basically, circuit switching would benefit large flows of data uh, between two cores. So we'll have only one overhead, which would open the uh, optical path, and then plenty of uh, messages can pass through uh, this uh, optical path. And uh, what we want would be to uh, uh, minimize the contention that we have in the circuit and therefore improve the communication latency. Uh, here, this graph shows uh, the proportion of uh, packets on the circuit, on the optical circuit, uh, versus the circuit period. So. After one path request has been uh, received, what uh, would happen is that the circuit would be o left open for a certain amount of time, which here is shown by the circuit period. And as we can see from this graph, uh, for circuit periods greater than 100 clock cycles, uh, we have a significant decrease in the proportion of packets on the circuits, which then a backup network would uh, be required to send this uh, information. So what we want is that uh, we don't want uh, the circuit period to be too small so that only one uh, message can pass through. But we don't want it to be too uh, long as well so that uh, to impede the over traffic that would actually uh, need to pass. So our work 
our work proposes a new scheduling algorithm uh, which intelligently uses information from the cache uh, hierarchy to set up these optical circuits. Since uh, we're considering the interaction between the network and the cache coherence protocol, we would actually need a full system simulator, which uh, we actually use GEM5 in this case. And uh, yes, for our simulation, we had the MESI cache coherence protocol. We use a 32-core uh, system. And uh, we use GEM5 to boot Linux. And then on Linux, we uh, run a POSSEC benchmark suite. So here are 10 of the benchmarks that we actually run. Now, we're going, how are we going to limit the actual circuit period? So we use the information uh, contained in the cache coherence protocol. Uh, there are a set of already predefined patterns from the finite state machine of the cache coherence protocol that uh, would actually take place. So here we're going to consider two of them, both of which are store requests. So the green color here represents uh, one core. The blue color, which we, you, you will see, represents a second core. In this one, the first core is requesting uh, an address which is found in a second core. So a request message would uh, be sent from the first core to the second one, uh, to the L2 bank of the second one. Now, the second one has an address, and uh, it will send a response message back to the uh, L1 of the first core, saying that, yes, it has got the address, and you can have it. The first one will send another message, which would be an unblock message, to the L2 bank of the second core, saying that uh, I have got the address now. You can uh, use it. And uh, the five message store request is very similar to the free message uh, store request, but the only difference is that the address is not found in the uh, L2 bank of the second core. Now, in the first one, free message store request, we would actually need to open the uh, optical circuit three times. So we have three times the overhead. Our algorithm would actually do only one of these overhead and leave the optical circuit open so that all free message requests, response, and unblock message can actually pass through the circuit. And similarly, in these five uh, message store requests, we would actually have only one overhead so, so that five messages can pass through. Um, yes. So now, since the actual uh, patterns depend on the cache coherence protocol, we would actually expect that uh, whatever application is run uh, uh, on uh, the system, we would uh, get exactly the same pattern over and over again. This is exactly what uh, this graph here shows. We have uh, uh, taken uh, the time taken to complete uh, one sequence. And uh, we plotted that against the uh, uh, frequency that uh, we actually obtained. And as we can see, for all the 10 benchmarks uh, we uh, simulated for POSSEC, we get exactly the same peaks. So each of these peaks represent a flow in the finite state machine of the cache coherence protocol. Uh, we saw uh, basically two of them. So this peak here represents the free message store request. This peak here represents the five message store request uh, seen in the previous slide. So if you uh, observe carefully, you will find uh, there's another peak which is uh, quite far off. It's around 600 clock cycle, and uh, which is a relatively longer time than the over, uh, over cycles. And uh, for this one, which represents actually a cache miss, which would uh, go back to the main memory. So this is why it takes uh, uh, a longer amount of time. So now going back to the free message store request, uh, core 2 is trying to open a communication with uh, core 25 to, send a, uh, to request the address that core 25 has. So what core 2 would need to do is to uh, send the path request. And since uh, no one is actually using like core 2 and core 25 are both free, but it has an arbitration uh, time. And after that, a grant would be issued uh, back to Core 2. Now, serialization can now uh, occur. And uh, a unidirectional circuit is open from uh, Core 2 to Core 25 so that uh, the first request message can be sent. 
exactly the same uh, sequence would occur for the response message. We again get the res uh, request, arbitration, and grant. And again, the same thing for the unblock message. So in this uh, free message store request, we open, uh, we had three times the uh, arbitration. What we propose is to have a scheme where we have only one of these arbitration and all free messages can be sent uh, uh, via the optical path. And here itself, we can see that if we consider only the arbitration and not the serialization and sending of the data, we have 67% uh, uh, of the overhead savings, since we have uh, only one overhead out of uh, three now. Now, what will happen uh, if Core 22, during this uh, uh, pattern, is trying to communicate with Core 25? So what will happen is that Core 22 would need to send, uh, again, a path request. And uh, since Core 25 is now taken up, uh, the request will need to wait in the request FIFO until this communication is done. And then the circuit is cleared so that core 22 can now uh, interact with core 25. So now, in terms of the results, the, the reason that we needed to simulate it is to see how this contention affected the actual gains we had for the circuit. The first graph that we have here uh, represents the average time taken uh, uh, per pattern. So we had uh, the whole pattern, and we measured how much time it would actually take uh, to complete the pattern. And we have all the 10 benchmarks. The yellow uh, part of the graph uh, represents the arbitration done only once per pattern, so basically our algorithm. And the black one represents arbitration done uh, every message, uh, so our baseline. So as we can see, all the yellow ones are smaller. But uh, one thing that we need to uh, consider in this graph is that the serialization time uh, would be heavily dependent on the nature of the message, whether it is a control message or data message. So the next graph uh, here actually uh, removes uh, this dependency. Now we're considering only the head latency per message. So now uh, we can see we do get uh, much larger savings if we do not consider the serialization de dependency. If you see for swaptions, we have up to 70.6% saving into uh, average head latency, which is uh, quite a lot. But uh, we need now to consider what are the if, uh, contentions. So first, we're going to consider, since it is leaving open an optical circuit, something else that want to use it uh, would, be, would need to wait longer. And this is exactly what uh, we get. All the yellow one are larger than our baseline. So it needs to wait lo longer in the uh, queue. So for VIPs, here we see uh, an increase of uh, around four times the uh, waiting time. But why does it, uh, these results affect the first original one that we get up to 70.6% saving? The reason is quite simple. Even though the waiting time in the queue is actually increased by quite a lot, the proportion of the packets that actually uses the queue is very small. So for VIPs, where we get a 400% uh, uh, increase in the waiting time in the queue, both uh, our algorithm and the, one, uh, the baseline have less than 2% of the total messages actually using the queue. So basically, if we consider 100 messages, 98 of them would uh, benefit from the very large savings as compared to only 2% uh, of it having a 400% increase uh, uh, waiting time in the queue. So as a conclusion, we have proposed uh, an algorithm which intelligently uh, uses information from the cache hierarchy to set up optical paths. Uh, this uh, algorithm provides significant latency uh, reductions up to 70.6% for the swaptions benchmark. And uh, now we need to consider that the, these results are for unchipped networks. So we have relatively very small uh, time of flight. Larger networks where we will have uh, longer time of flight would definitely benefit more from uh, this algorithm. 
Some examples might be multiple socket servers or rack scale networks. And as a future work, uh, we are considering, we would like to consider the implications of this algorithm on uh, energy consumption of the allocator and control circuits, since in this work we only considered uh, the la latency implications. We would like to look at the performance of this algorithm for heavier traffic. In this work, we considered the POSEC benchmark, uh, and uh, POSEC benchmark are very lightly loaded. So we didn't get uh, very much uh, traffic into the waiting uh, queue. And also, we would like to measure the performance improvements uh, in a full system Gem5 simulator. Uh, thank you for your attention. Any questions? Did you have a physical model of your optical circuit switch? Because uh, um, there's time of flight, and there's also just the time it takes to reconfigure. And I'm wondering. No, no, it's actually a very preliminary work. So basically, for now, we just uh, generated the trace files in Gem uh, Gem Five. And then we simulated uh, via MATLAB. We okay. ad added the uh, theoretical. Uh, so uh, it's value. ideal. Yes. So the only the only latency associated with the switch is time of flight. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Answer questions. No. Thank you. Okay.